morning. We're the Biggers. I'm Ed. And I'm Paula. Welcome to today's service of the Tucson Church of Christ. 2020 has been a challenging year for each of us, but we wish you all a blessed 2021. Paul and I have been blessed to be part of this Christian fellowship for about four years now. The Tucson Church of Christ is a group of caring Christians, loving one another, seeking to serve one another, encourage one another, and reaching out to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those others. We're happy you have joined us virtually, but we would much rather be with you in person. David wrote in Psalm 122, verse 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord to worship. And won't we be glad when it's time for us to go together to the house of worship in person, face to face, side by side. It'll be a blessing to be back together once again. Let us go to our Father in prayer. Father, thank you so much for loving us and blessing us in so many ways beyond our imagination. We know that you'll be with us together as we come together virtually uh, at this time to praise you, to sing songs to you, to worship, encourage one another, hear from your word, and help us to seek to do all of this to glorify you in whatever we do. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Your power made this universe. 
this mountain with my hands wide open i will climb this mountain with my hands wide open i will climb this mountain with my hands wide open i will climb this mountain with my hands wide open i will climb this mountain with my hands wide open i will climb this mountain with my hands wide open i will climb this mountain with my hands wide open i will climb this mountain with my hands nothing I hold on to there's 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 nothing I Tucson Church of Christ. Uh, Happy Sunday. It's great to be with you all this morning, and I'm so grateful to be able to be up here and preaching here on this beautiful Sunday. Uh, My name is Dom Munson, for those of you who don't know me, and uh, I currently lead the uh, campus ministry here at the University of Arizona alongside Nyla Walker. And so, uh, yeah, I'm really honored and privileged that I get to preach today to, uh, to the church. And uh, welcome to all of those uh, who are visiting with us this morning. We're so grateful that you're here. And uh, we really hope that you have a great time uh, worshiping God with us and that you can get plugged into uh, a group here. And please reach out to us if you are interested in that. Um, But we're grateful that you're here. So thank you for being with us. 2020 was a really crazy year. And I I know probably every sermon that's preached here in this early new year probably probably has said something along those lines. Um, But I do want to wish everyone a happy new year, and I'm honestly really grateful that 2020 is over. Uh, Not that much has really changed quite yet as the vaccine starts making its way slowly to the general population, Uh, but more so just I'm grateful for symbolism's sake that 2020 is over. 2020 was a pretty tough year. I mean, it was a year that really unprecedented in a lot of our lives, and so it's great that it's over, and... Uh, this sermon, though, I want to really reflect on some of the one of the big takeaways that I had uh, spiritually from the year of 2020. And obviously, there are many, but one of those takeaways and what I want to really speak about today is I feel like what I learned about a year where it seemed like everything was put on pause. I think what I really learned was that God is always at work. That despite when everything is frozen, when the world is slowing down, when we're quarantined and and stuck inside, 
God is still at work. And I've seen that so much this year. And that's what I really want to preach on this morning. The title of the sermon today is God is always working. God is always working. And we're going to read uh, John chapter 5. So if you could turn with me to John chapter 5. And we're going to read in verse 16 through 18. So I'll give you guys a second to turn there. And as you turn there, I do want to talk a little bit about context, about what we're about to read. So we're going to read John 5, 16 through 18. And so what happens in John 1, John 5, verse 1 to 15? Well, Jesus, uh, in John uh, 5, verse 1, we see Jesus goes on the Sabbath day. So the Sabbath for Jews is a day of rest, a day where they're not supposed to work at all. And Jesus chooses on a Sabbath to go to this place called Bethesda. And Bethesda was, uh, was in Jerusalem. It was actually a, a pool that people believed uh, they had healing powers. And so they, they believed that if you laid out the sick, uh, paralyzed, uh, anyone with a terminal illness, um, they believed that when the water stirred, they believed that the angels themselves were doing that. And that whoever went into the water first would be healed of their sickness or disease. And so this is Bethesda. And Bethesda in the Greek, uh, or in the Aramaic, uh, it means house of mercy, or it could mean house of grace. And so Jesus, on the Sabbath, goes to this place called Bethesda, I, otherwise known as house of grace in the English. He goes there, and he heals a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years. This man had been invalid for 38 years. That's a long time to not be able to walk. And so Jesus goes to him and he heals him. And of course, because it, he did this on a Sabbath, the, the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders, had something to say about it. And so that's where we're picking up in John chapter 5, verse 16 now. And so I'll read it right now. It says, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, who was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. In this passage, if you keep reading, Jesus makes a lot of claims, and I definitely encourage you to keep reading because it's an amazing uh, uh, discussion that Jesus brings up after this. But the claim that I really want to focus on here is this one that he makes that I just read. And it's that his father is always at his work, and he too is working. Jesus makes the claim that God is always working, that neither him nor God ever go away from their work. Now, even on the sa Sabbath, Jesus shows us that he never rests from showing people grace and mercy. He never rests from doing good out of his love for people. And that's the claim that Jesus makes. And, and before we go into my, I have three points. Before we go into my first point, I do want to talk about this a little bit because maybe some of you who are maybe more skeptical or uh, they qu you question um, what they read, which is good. Um, you may be asking, okay, well, how can Jesus say that God never rests or that God's always working if he rested on the seventh day? That seems kind of like a contradiction. So in Genesis, we see after God creates the universe, he rests from his work. Well, we have to understand, and before we can move on, I do want to answer this question a little bit. And there's obviously there's much more that you can research about this question and, and dig deeper into this question. But in Genesis 2, verse 2 to 3, the word for rest that's used for God resting on the seventh day is Shavath. It's, it's a, where you get the word Sabbath from, the Shavath. And it means, more so it means to cease. When we think of rest, we think of our human limitations. When we get tired, we need to rest in order to uh, you know, rejuvenate and to, to re, you know, recover. But the thing with this word is that this has nothing to do with being tired or fatigued. The word Shavath just means that God saw that things were over, 
that he had created the world so perfectly in a way that he could cease from his work. And so God, because he's outside of time and space, he's able to order the universe in a way where he does, he's both finished his work, but he's still at work. It, we still understand him at work because we are limited by time. And so God both finished his work and could cease from his work, but at the same time, God is always still at work in our lives. And that's really what we're going to talk about is the current work that God's still doing in our lives. And my first point, is that God's mercy is always at work. Jesus shows mercy to a man here who had been unable to walk, had no friends, no one to help him get into the pool, if you read earlier. Jesus heals a man who had been so desperately in need of healing. And Jesus does this on a Sabbath. And he does this at a place that was also known as House of Mercy. And as a rabbi, Jesus, uh, he would have done all of this very intentionally. It's not like Jesus would have just happened to show up to a place called House of Mercy, happened to do it on a Saturday or on a, on a Sabbath, and happened to run into the man who'd been invalid for 38 years. No, Jesus chose this as a very specific place and time and person to preach a greater point and to help the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people and us today understand a much deeper and bigger spiritual lesson. And so what is that lesson? Well, I'm sure there are many options. I'm sure there are many angles you could look at this, and I'm sure Jesus had many different reasons for doing this. But I think one of the big ones, to me, what I learned from this is that I believe it shows that God prioritizes showing mercy over following rules. And Jesus goes to heal this man on a day where he was not supposed to be at work, according to the law. And I want to be clear, rules are not a bad thing, and, and we have to obey God's commands. And even Jesus he makes it clear that the Sabbath was important. And, and Jesus didn't just break the Sabbath. or Jesus never really broke the Sabbath. He was trying to show people what truly is important by using the Sabbath as a tool to show them, to teach them. And so Jesus on the Sabbath shows that showing mercy is more imper- important than following certain rules that neglect mercy. And so the Sabbath, yes, a good thing. And, and it was meant for God's people to, uh, to learn that they needed, their, they needed to be sustained by him. They needed to rest, to reflect on his goodness and, and his provision. And yes, the Sabbath is still a good thing, and I believe it's still relevant today. But Jesus wanted to make it clear to the Jewish people that if you fail to show love for somebody because you're trying to uphold the law, then that, there is no law in that. It does not fulfill the law. And that, that's, that's why Jesus says in Matthew 22 that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second greatest command is to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says this sums up, this fulfills all of the law and the prophets. That, of course, rules are important. God's commands need to be followed, but not if, there's, if they supersede love. Love and mercy needs to always be the priority in our minds and in our hearts. Rules must be followed, but they must be followed with love as the focus. And we see here that Jesus shows us God's character is that he never stops showing love, no matter what time, no matter what place, no matter what situation, no matter what person. God's mercy is always at work. I want to be clear about this. When it comes to love, there is no rest. Love never rests because God never rests from love. That's amazing. I, I find so much comfort in knowing that God will love me no matter where I'm at spiritually, no matter where I'm at in life, no matter how old, how young I am, no matter 
what, what I'm going through, no matter how many friends I have, or not, no matter how much money I have, God loves me all the same. And his mercy is new every morning, as Lamentations 3 says. That every day I wake up, no matter how much I fail, in God's eyes, I'm forgiven and I've been given mercy. And that is true for you as well. God does not take a break from loving you and for, from get, for forgiving you from your sins. No matter what sins you've got yourself into, no matter how far you've fallen, no matter even how well spiritually you are doing, God's love remains the same at all times. And we always need his mercy just as much as any other time. God's mercy is always at work. And it makes me think of uh, one of my middle school, uh, who wasn't, wasn't my teacher, but he's actually my, my track coach. He was a teacher in the school. But um, in middle school, his name was Mr. Krill. Uh, so in middle school, he, uh, Mr. Krill would choose to uh, do, use his Saturday mornings um, to go and feed the homeless. And basically the whole week, he would have people, uh, middle schoolers, you know, you know, students sign up uh, you know, with their parents to um, signing up as chaperones, he would have a sign-up sheet for middle schoolers to sign up to go with him on Saturdays to carpool over to the city of Philadelphia to feed the homeless. And it, it was pretty amazing. Mr. Krill, uh, you know, we would, I, I only went once or twice. I think it was probably in, in like seventh grade. Um, but we would go, we meet at the middle school, we'd all get in a circle, and Mr. Krill would lead a prayer. And then uh, we would drive over about 20 minutes to Philly and we would spend a few hours giving out all the food that we had uh, to the homeless. And it was amazing. He did this every week. And and Mr. Krill, you know, he was a teacher full time. Uh, He was a coach. And so I imagine, and and he was a religious man too. So I'm sure his Sundays were, his Sundays were busy with church. Saturday probably was his only actual day off. And Mr. Krill used it to, to show love and mercy to people who needed it. And it's amazing that, you know, now 12, 13 years later, I can look back at that and say, what well, that had a huge impact in my life. To see Mr. Krill's example and how he used his time so selflessly to serve others. And that makes me think of Jesus here in this story. Like that is such a Christ-like example that Jesus didn't make any excuses. He didn't say, oh, well, it's the Sabbath. You know, it's been a hard week of ministry. Uh, let's just rest. Let's just, you know, let's just take time and to decompress and we'll start again tomorrow. We can heal that guy tomorrow. No, Jesus makes it very clear that he is always at work. His mercy never stops. And so he chooses to use a day of rest to help others. And that's what Mr. Krill did in my life. And I had a lasting impact in my life. And that's only possible because when we understand God's mercy always being at work in us, we will then want to go and turn and show other people mercy. And so let me ask you, do you believe that God's mercy is enough for you? Do you believe that God's mercy is still at work in your life? And does your life, the way that you show mercy to people, does it reflect the mercy that God shows to you? These are some good questions to think about. Maybe write down. But God's mercy is always at work in our lives. And therefore, because of that, mercy should always be at work in our lives. My second point is God is always working through you. So in addition to God's uh, mercy always being at work, we also begin to understand that God is always working through each one of us. And how does this happen? Well, when we understand, like I was saying before, when we understand God's mercy in our lives, we understand and we want to be used by God. And when we disconnect from God's love, we don't want to be used by God. It feels forced. It feels like legalism. It feels like uh, we just have to do things. And we've all been there at points. I've been there. But when we're connected to God's love, when we're connected to his mercy, we understand that God wants to use us and he wants to work through us. And this last year for me has taught me uh, about this many ways that again, in a year where everything seemed to be on pause, I've seen God work so much 
And I feel like I've seen him even work more than I've seen him work in other years in my life. And that's amazing to look at that and, and to learn a lesson about that, that God is always working through us and in us. I mean, the ways that I've seen God work in my life this year is, well, when he moved me out to Tucson at the beginning of, of quarantine, I drove out all the way from New Jersey to Tucson, and my life has changed so much because of that, that God's given me an opportunity to be mentored by Rob, uh, to be uh, here with uh, my best friend James, and to uh, build so many new relationships with amazing brothers and sisters, uh, to, to join this church family, and it's been amazing to see God work in that way. God's given me time this year to read the whole Bible in order for the first time. And that was awesome. Now I can finally say I read the Bible in order. That was, um, it was an amazing opportunity that God gave me this year. I had the honor of studying the Bible with two different uh, men who had become Christians in this past year. And alongside with many of you, I was able to help make 30,000 face shields for frontline workers over the summer uh, when the community needed it most. And of course, shout out to the Dikachea family for, for leading that, and for letting God use them in that way. I've been able to use my spiritual gift, uh, one of my spiritual gifts of preaching, to be able to preach multiple times to the church. And that's been awesome. And of course, I've got, I got engaged in August, and I got married in December. So all in 2020, getting engaged and getting married. And so God, you know, he's been doing a lot of things in my life, and there's so much more. And I even believe there's more 10 years down the road that I'll look back on 2020 and say, wow, that year God did this as well that I don't quite see right now. But God is, is still at work. And I've seen that in my life this year, that God has not stopped working. And God's not, he's not going to stop working in any of your lives. God's still wanting to use you. And he is using you. All of us, and this is a promise that God makes in 1 Corinthians 12. He talks about how the Spirit gives us all gifts. That we've all been given spiritual gifts appointed to us for a very specific purpose, that we could use it to edify the church. And God's given you a gift. If you're a Christian, you have the spirit inside of you, and he has supplied you with some particular gift that the church needs. And it's not the same as anybody else's gift. You are unique, and you are needed in the church. Without your gift, without your spirit-given gift, the church cannot be fully edified. It's a body that needs every part. And so are you using your gifts for God? Are you allowing God to work through you? Maybe your gift is encouragement, and you're really good at making meals for people, and you're really good at, or maybe you're really good at, for, at praying for people. Maybe you're really good um, at preaching, or maybe you're really good at teaching. Maybe you're really good at serving. Maybe, you know, you love to sing. Maybe you're really good at technology. I mean, there's so many different gifts. It's like so exciting when you start thinking about things that way. And I think sometimes we can sit in church and just think, how can I be given to? But we can forget that the purpose of us being in the church is to glorify God, is to be used by God, to both help us spiritually, but to help others spiritually. And so are you using your gifts? What are your gifts? In the year of 2020, do you feel confident that you said that you really built up the church with what God's given you? Or did you kind of just take a break and hold back? God has given you amazing gifts, amazing strengths, and God wants to work through you, and he's always at work, Jesus says. And so if God is not working in your life, it's not God that's not working. It's whether or not you're allowing him to work. It's whether or not you're choosing to see his work in your life. So let's choose to use our gifts for God and to be used by him. My last point is that God is completing his work in you. So just as much as God is still at work uh, through us, wanting to use us, he's also completing his work in us that he's working on our characters, he's working in our lives, he's trying to finish what has been started. And that will always be the case in our lives until the final day when we're with God in heaven for eternity, experiencing, experiencing eternal rest, 
God is still perfecting and completing you. He's molding and he's sculpting you. So a little bit of a story here. Uh, when I was a freshman in high school, I chose to give up football, uh, a sport that I had played a lot of my life, uh, because my freshman year, they had just decided to get rid of freshman sports. And so basically, because I was afraid of going up against 18-year-olds and, and hitting, like tackling seniors, when I was a little undersized freshman, um, I needed an excuse so that my friends wouldn't make fun of me. And so my excuse was, let me just join another sport so that at least I can say, oh, well, you know, I'm not playing football because I'm doing this sport. And so because I had some background with track and I knew I could make the team uh, because there's no cuts, I decided to join cross country. And because of that, I really didn't care much about it. I, I, I didn't try hard. I walked when my coach wasn't looking. Uh, and I, I just really wasn't really into it. I actually remember my first day of practice, I threw up everywhere in front of the whole, every like fall sports team, like the soccer teams and field hockey teams. Uh, first day, basically first day of summer of high school, I, I threw up everywhere in front of everybody. And, uh, and so I, I really like didn't like it. I wasn't really into it, um, but it gave me an excuse to get out of football. And so with that mentality, my first race, obviously, I didn't care too much about how I did. And so I ran this race and it was a 5,000 meter race. And I, I finished, I think I was definitely in the bottom 20 percentile of the race, maybe even, maybe even the bottom 10 percentile. Um, I wasn't the, I wasn't the last person to finish on my team. Um, but out of the hundred or so people in the race, I probably finished like 80th or 90th. Um, but even though there were other guys on my team behind me, my coach, uh, Coach Grotini, we called him Coach Gro. He, uh, he like sat me down while the rest of the team went off. He didn't sit down the other guys that finished behind me. He sat me down at the base of this tree, uh, right by like where all of our uh, bags and stuff were. And I remember him sitting me at this tree and scolding me. He was so angry at me. And he just basically went off and he just told me, he said, Dom, there is so much more in you you were not giving your, your best, and I'm not gonna accept that. It's ridiculous to watch you run and to not actually try. You can be great, and you can be an awesome runner, and you can be a great teammate to your team, but until you start giving your best, that will never happen. And I was sitting there, and I, I mean, I was a bit upset and flustered, and I was confused, like why is he sitting me down but no one else? And I just remember thinking, like, later on, like, wow, like, maybe, he, maybe he's right. Like, maybe there is something in me. Maybe I can be really good at this sport if I really put my best foot forward. And that conversation ended up inspiring me to believe that there was something in me that I had not yet seen. That my coach was right in some way. That he saw something in me that was true. And so I, I decided that I wanted to see... I wanted to see if that was true, if what he saw in me was true. And so I started giving my best. I started going on longer runs. I started running consistently. And over time, I gave my best more and more and more. And uh, it was amazing to see the results. I started seeing this potential in me unveiled. And uh, you know, by the end of my freshman year of high school, uh, or no, sorry, end of the fall, uh, the cross country season, I ended up breaking uh, the freshman record for our school for the 5,000 meter cross country race. And that was a really cool, like, man, like maybe there's something more to this. Um, and, and, and slowly I started working my way up and running faster and faster. And by the end of my freshman year, I ended up being uh, the second fastest uh, freshman in all of Southern New Jersey. And so I started winning awards, getting recognition, and it was pretty cool. And so I kept running, and, and by my senior year, uh, I, was, I broke all of our school records in every distance event. Uh, I got a full ride scholarship uh, to go to uh, a Division I school at Rutgers University, uh, and many other scholarships to different Division I schools. Um, I finished first team all state uh, in cross country, the top seven runners in cross country in the state. Uh, this is the whole state, all private schools, public schools. I finished sixth overall, getting first team all state. Uh, I went to college. I, I ran really well in college. Uh, I ended up being named captain of my track team my senior year of college. And all of these things, I just 
I would have never guessed my first race when I first joined cross country that that would ever happen. But it was my coach's vision for me that helped me believe that there was something in me that I didn't yet see. And so I worked harder and harder. And if it weren't for that conversation, I would have never ended up doing the things that I did with the running. And I'm so grateful for my coach doing that. See, after my first cross country race, my coach saw not just my failure, he saw the potential in me. My coach chose not to confront me solely with my failure, but he chose to confront me with my potential. And this sparked an, an innate longing for me to want to see that potential fulfilled. So I worked harder every single day. I gave my best. I gave my heart because I believe that there was something in me that my coach believed in me. I was shaped eventually into the runner that my coach believe, helped me believe that I could be. And it wasn't my failure that inspired me. No, rather it was the potential, the vision that my coach gave me of who I could be as a runner that inspired me. In church, where have we seen this before? Well, just as I was sat down at the base of the tree confronted by my coach, we all have been seated at the base of the cross confronted by God. Confronted not just by our failures, but even more so confronted by our potential. The cross forces us to face our shortcomings, and that's always true. Our sin, our insecurities, our weakness. But even more so, the cross forces us to face the vision and the potential that God sees in, in us and for us. God does not give up on you when he sees your weakness. And what the cross shows is that God gave up everything so that our potential could be fulfilled, so that we could see the completion of his work in us. It's not our failures that inspire us to change and to let God work in us. It's rather his vision for who we, who we can be and who he made us to be. And there is so much more in you than a spiritual D1 athlete. Rather, what is in you is Jesus Christ himself. God wants you to become more like his son. And he believes you can be. He believes you can be perfected. He believes there is an end goal for your life. That there is something great that you can be. That you can be used in incredible ways that you can do incredible things through his name, in Christ's name. But we have to let God work in us. And we can't be inspired or led by our failures. We must allow God's belief in us and faith in us drive us forward. And we see that on the cross. It's the cross that is always working in us. It's the cross that helps us be transformed. And so let me ask, how will you respond when God confronts you with your potential? Will it change you? Or will you stay the same? Do you allow God's vision for you to inspire change in your character? To be more like Jesus? In what ways is God calling you to change to be the man or the woman that he made you to be? What are ways that you are not being like Christ, that God wants to change in you? And are you allowing him to change you? The moment you stop being willing to change uh, for the better is the moment that you choose to forsake the potential God sees in you. God is always at work in you. He's always at work. And so are you allowing him to complete his work? Church, God is always working. And we see this in his mercy. God is always at work with mercy, giving us mercy and grace. God is always wanting to use us and working through us to do great things. And lastly, God is always working in us to complete his work in us, to change our characters, to be more like his son. Are you allowing God to work in your life and through your life? Are you content? 
with staying the same way that you've always been. God, church, let's choose to let God work, up, work in us and through us. Let's be a church that constantly becomes individually more like Jesus and holistically more like Jesus. Thank you for so, so much for letting me preach. And I really hope that this message encourages you and, and challenges you and inspires you to be the man and the woman that God knows you can be and wants you to be. Love you, church. I hope you all have a great Sunday. Good morning, church. We are the Browns. My name is Lewis. This is my lovely wife, Danny. Uh, this is the time of the service that we do the communion, where we focus our hearts on Jesus and his sacrifice. And uh, yeah, so we'll start off with the, the scripture here in Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 23. It says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to, uh, another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So yeah, let's have that heart to uh, hold fast to the confession that we made, uh, the hope that we have in Jesus, and how we can stir one another up towards love and good deeds, uh, good works, and even, even if we can't meet together, hopefully soon we'll be able to meet together again, but still being able to encourage others. You know, we have so many ways to do that. And so, yeah, let's take the time to love each other and show our appreciation for what Jesus has done in our lives. And uh, yeah, so my wife is now going to pray for the communion. Let's pray. God, I'm so grateful for this time to, to pray to you with my brothers and sisters and, uh, you know, that we take time each week to reflect um, on the cross, on Jesus' sacrifice, on the fact that you gave us a second chance. We have been redeemed and uh, you have forgiven us of the, the many sins that we've brought against you. God, I pray that not only this time, but throughout the week, we reflect on your love, we reflect on your grace, and we take advantage of the opportunities that you give us to live that new life. Uh, as my husband was saying, I pray that it's not something that we just think about privately, but something that we share with each other and encourage each other with. And that, uh, yeah, God, it is hard <laughs> to meet during these times, um, to stay encouraged uh, through Zoom and uh, when there's different things going on in the world, but I pray that we can trust you to know that you're in control and to remember the great things that you've done in our life, uh, not just when you um, forgave us of our sins, not when we were baptized, but all the other times too, God, that um, while we were still sinners, um, before um, we knew you and how you've changed our lives ongoing. Uh, God, I pray that this is a, a time where we're focused on you, um, that, you know, we're taking this throughout the week. So uh, pray you're with us in this communion. We love you. Amen. Amen. Places no one goes. Where I lay my heart before you, and the only voice I need is yours. Mountains tremble every time. from dust and all the lies that have consumed my heart they are shattered as you rebuilt my trust all 
the times that I've been fighting. You were calling out my name. Fear disguised as cautious wisdom. Help me tight behind the walls that I I built my fortress so that it would last. Pray for courage and try to feel brave. But at your voice, all my defenses fall, and I realize you alone are my strength. Calling out my name Longing just to bring me back home You are here in the chaos Always running after me All this time I've never walked alone with me in the quiet when I cannot hear your words still they come in gentle whispers and the colors that stretch across the earth stops to watch your glory fall crashing thunder and flashes in the clouds as storms give way to peace in dead of night the heavens speak volumes who you You are here in the quiet places calling out my name Longing just to bring me back Good morning, church. My name is James Skinner, and I have the privilege of doing today's collection message. I first of all want to thank Karen for last week's message. It was very helpful and also convicting and encouraging all at the same time. So thank you so much, Karen. Uh, for today's message, I would like to share a story of how God worked in my life when I made a difficult decision to tithe first. Last year in March, unfortunately, me as well as other sisters in the church, we experienced a car accident. Uh, it completely totaled my car, and luckily nobody was badly injured, uh, just a couple scrapes, uh, which I'm so, so thankful for. 
Well, unfortunately, with the result of a car crash, I had to get a new car. And by the grace of God, the car accident happened on a Saturday. And on the following Wednesday, I just so happened to have received not only my tax return, but also my company's yearly bonus at the exact same time. And so I was so thankful and encouraged by how God worked that out as I sat there and saw this large uh, sum of money in my bank account, I was like, oh, thank God I can pay for a car. Um, but then I realized, oh, you know, God is calling me to tithe this amount. And so I, I, I sat there long and hard. And as a financial analyst, I do a lot of math. And so I'm doing the math of what I have to tithe. And I'm like, oh, that's a large amount. I could, I could get a nicer car if I don't tithe. And I sat there long and hard. And finally, by the grace of God, I said, okay, I need to tie this. I need to put God first. And so I ended up doing that, luckily, and I tied that amount. Funny enough, a couple weeks after that, I checked my pay stub at work uh, for the next, um, for my next payment. And I have my base salary and then there was a, an added bonus added on top of it. And I was very confused and I was very naive and I, I, I went up to my manager and I said, hey, um, I got this, is this a mistake? And he turned around and said, no, uh, because, of you, because of what you accomplished last month, that certain activity, we decided to give you an added bonus. And I was so surprised, was not expecting it. And I went back to my office and I sat down. Then I realized it was the exact same amount that I had tithed two weeks prior. And I, I share all this to encourage you that when, when you put God first, God comes through. And I wanna share a scripture as well to tie along with the story. It says um, in Psalm 112, verse five, and I, I truly believe this, it says, good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. And I wanna encourage you to lend freely, to give to God what is his, and see what God will do in your life. Let me pray. God, thank you for uh, this beautiful morning to be able to have the message, but also to put our faith into practice. God, you have given us more than we could ever ask or imagine. And I pray that we can respect you, that we could admire you through our finances, or that we will tithe what belongs to you and see what amazing things you do in our lives. Lord, I love you. In your Holy Son's name I pray. Amen.
giver of salvation. By His stripes I am Praise is what I'm praying.